Hi, what is comparative philosophy and what are its main challenges? Well, just as the question, what is philosophy, has no uncontroversial answer, so is the case for comparative philosophy. So I'm going to investigate this question by looking at works by Robert Smith and Chris Goto Jones on this topic. I'm going to express my own understanding of what is comparative philosophy. As for the main challenges of comparative philosophy, I'll refer to Martha Nussbaum and David Wong and talk about the vices that may plague cross-cultural analysis and also issues with this idea of commensurability that may arise when one attempts to engage with an unfamiliar philosophical tradition. Finally, I'm going to bring up the fact that comparative philosophy as a subfield is marginalized with respect to the professional academic discipline of philosophy. Overall, I'm going to argue that philosophy as a discipline needs to transcend geocultural boundaries by making comparative philosophy commonplace in order to evolve to fit a globalized world. Let's go. Robert Smith in 2009 says that comparative philosophy makes an attempt to move across the boundaries of otherwise distinct philosophical traditions. Now through this process of engagement involving multiple sides, each individual self will gain understanding of the other, and the exchange may also enrich understanding of the self. But unlike geoculturally exclusive traditions such as European continental philosophy and analytic philosophy, comparative philosophy doesn't really have a set of works that we can call ca canonical without controversy. Chris Goto Jones in 2013 says that comparative philosophy is really an umbrella term carrying some ambiguity which, quote, remains resilient for as long as philosophy as a whole maintains that its professionalism is bounded by European and recently American identity. Indeed, a possible goal of comparative philosophy is to challenge the very definition of philosophy itself. What counts as philosophy? This issue emerges very quickly when one looks outside one's own tradition and looks at other ways of conceiving and expressing ideas. For example, you might ask, what styles of writing are appropriate for philosophy? Or, is writing the only medium to convey philosophical thought? Well, these questions may never get asked if one only concerns themselves with an established tradition and do not look outside or reflect upon it. Martha Nussbaum, in 1997, identifies two types of vices, descriptive and normative. Descriptive vices cause thinkers to distort the way they perceive and present the traditions that they are learning about, whereas normative vices have to do with the evaluation of traditions. It's linked to description as description introduces and shapes the ideas in thinkers' minds before they are able to evaluate those ideas. I'll specifically address the vices of descriptive romanticism and normative skepticism, since these seem to be the most extreme, but also easiest to fall victim to. Nussbaum points out that descriptive romanticism distorts both the thinker's familiar tradition and the other unfamiliar tradition that they're engaging with. And she uses the example of a European student turning to Indian spirituality and poetry. And they may downplay and ignore the diverse cultures home to the European lands that they are from without even realizing. And I quote, it is all too easy to misunderstand ourselves in the light of a simplistic contrast with the other. And this vice is a problem even in textbooks that are supposed to serve as a balanced introduction into a tradition. And it is not exclusive to academic accounts by those whose home tradition, so to speak, is European or American. It can also exist among Indian or Chinese or other non-Western philosophers. Seeing that we could be too susceptible to misunderstanding and misjudgment, you may want to end up suspending all judgment towards the traditions that you're engaging with. But unfortunately, that is ironically a normative vice known as skepticism. Before one develops a reasonable grasp of the tradition that they're learning about, it is suitable to suspend judgment, aka to adopt skepticism as their initial position, perhaps to maintain respect. But it does become a problem if skepticism remains as that position in the intermediate or advanced stage of learning. It is another form of being patronizing. You're viewing the other as way too different to even judge by similar standards. Now I'm going to talk about the issues regarding commensurability or perhaps incommensurability. So incommensurability is the impossibility to compare two things due to their differences being too significant. 
So David Wong in 2001 mentions that some thinkers assert this idea of radical incommensurability, where, I quote, the questions and answers in one tradition cannot sustain meaningful statement in the other tradition. Well, this attitude may simply shut down discussion and may not be productive. There is a more moderate version of incommensurability proposed by Samuel Fleischhacker in 1992, which is rooted in Wittgenstein's view that, quote, knowledge depends on a background of shared assumptions and standards of evidence. So, for example, the classical Chinese tradition, as represented by Taoism and Confucianism, conceives understanding of the world as something that's inseparable from the interests of becoming attuned to it. Whereas modern science encourages linking understanding with prediction and manipulation instead. So these two attitudes paint different world pictures, so to speak, in the minds of thinkers. These are different orderings of interest that determines how we go about trying to have reliable beliefs. If two such orderings are too different, then they may be incommensurable. Now, some may also use language as a measure of commensurability. If there is a central term in one tradition, for which no equivalent term can be found in another, then the two may also be incommensurable, since it would make sense for a term to have been coined if the concept that it represents has value for discussion. And if it hasn't been coined, then maybe that tradition doesn't see the value for discussion for those concepts. With a multitude of objectives and challenges presented to comparative philosophers, comparative philosophy has not become its own tradition like the geoculturally exclusive traditions considered within comparative philosophy. The professional discipline of philosophy has largely been built around established traditions with hundreds if not thousands of years of history, so it's really hard to separate these traditions from geography and culture. But, the information age has seen a reduction in the figurative distances and separation between traditions, and it has become as viable as ever to engage in cross-cultural exchange and expand established traditions, resulting in a growing overlap between them, and that calls for comparative methodologies to be developed and to be employed. Seeing this, one could envision radical changes to the way philosophy as a whole is conceptualized. Smith suggests that comparative philosophy can only be done well if thinkers have, quote, mastery of a broad range of material which prohibits the possibility of any meaningful expertise in some narrowly defined specialization. Now this idea goes directly in contrary to the direction that students and teachers nowadays are encouraged to follow in modern academia, and that is to specialize and narrow down the scope of their focus in order to produce high quality understanding and thought within that narrow down scope. So, not only does comparative philosophy involve an unpopular view of philosophy, but also an unpopular view of professional academia as a whole. This is why comparative philosophy as a subfield is so marginalized, because if its true nature is to be realized, then it would have to be more than a subfield. In fact, it would probably have to encompass all of the ways that one can possibly do philosophy and set those methodologies, as well as the underlying principles, into dialogue. The descriptive and normative vices plaguing cross-cultural analysis can be more easily avoided if the thinker has more peers to help identify signs of these vices and to maintain a balanced set of interpretations and judgments, especially so if they have diverse backgrounds. The issues regarding commensurability may always be present, but there is also a multitude of angles to tackle these issues from. We can see that the main challenges of comparative philosophy are really linked to the whole subfield being situated at the margins of professionalized philosophy. So, it is clear to see that advancing comparative philosophy towards the mainstream will be a key step in the path of helping philosophy evolve and modernize. Thank you.